Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for RedGiantTV.com. Recently, some awesome trap code work from motion graphics artist, compositor, and designer Owen Street caught our eye, and we asked if he would be willing to break down some of his excellent work. Obviously, he said yes, or this would be the shortest tutorial you ever saw. So, in this episode of Red Giant TV, Owen will break down how he created some of the beautiful and evocative work he did for De Montfort University using trap code 3D stroke as light to help tell the story. One thing to watch out for here is the way in which Owen uses After Effects. He uses a ton of great shortcuts and time-saving techniques that taught me a lot. Take it away, man. Enlighten us. Hello. I'm going to show you some great techniques I used on some commercials that I worked on in After Effects. Just before we start, though, I'd like to explain what direction this tutorial is going to take. First of all, I'd like to discuss some of what went into the pre-production of this piece. Then I'd like to discuss some of the production stage. And finally, I'm really looking forward to showing you what I did in post-production inside After Effects, along with some trap code plugins. I hope that this way you can really get a handle not just on how to create some nice effects, but also why those effects were chosen, why they are appropriate, and also other insights into what went into the whole process of creating these sequences. Let's take a look at what we are going to be exploring. And we'll just pause it there for a second. OK, well I hope you'll agree that that's a nicely shot, dynamic, stylish piece with, I hope, some really nice effects tying the whole thing together. As is usually the case, there is a team of people behind the creation of a great commercial or title sequence or movie SFX shot. So with this in mind, I'd first like to explain some of what went into this piece before I even fired After Effects up. I was asked to work on a series of six 10-second commercials by a production company called Cromfley de Lieber Productions. The end client for these commercials was the UK-based De Montfort University. Before the shoot took place, the director, Julian Cromfley, and producer Ed Lieber came in with mood boards and ideas on the kinds of effects they would like to achieve for each of the six commercials. We discussed what was possible in After Effects and in CGI, taking into account, of course, the amount of time available to us, which is always a consideration. The idea behind the campaign was definitely going to involve filming exceptional alumni or graduates of the university, demonstrating their particular area of expertise. Instead of choosing to show each expert in a real-world situation, the idea was to represent their specialism via special effects. In particular, each individual's area of expertise was to be described in light. Now, we've been watching this example for a while. Let me show you some more examples of the uh, commercials, just to show you what I mean. So in this example, our subject is Philippa Berry, who is Professor of Geomatics, which is all about the gathering geographic information and in particular she describes being involved in mapping the earth which is why I use trap code form to describe the idea of landmass. The effect starts off fairly loosely and then moves along with the gesture of a hand creating at first a flat surface which then rises up to create a modulated landscape. This is in order to give the impression of hills and valleys. In this example, a senior research fellow of the university is featured. His name is Parneet Paul, and he is a chartered environmentalist. Now, part of his specialism is in dealing with water systems, and so I used Trapco Particular to create the idea of fluid flowing behind him. I then used 3D Stroke to create the individual streams, which are generated when he puts his hand into the particular stream. We wanted some interaction between the talent and the effect. OK, so that's just to give you an overview of the kinds of different approaches um, that we we undertook. Um, but this is the commercial that we're going to be uh, deconstructing a little bit and having a look at how it was built. So in this example, the kinetic energy of Akram Khan's dance moves is being represented by light. I created these light streams in trap code 3D stroke, as I mentioned previously, but there is quite a lot else going on here. So just in case you've already had a look at 3D stroke and you're thinking, well, that's a relatively simple plugin, perhaps, please bear with me here because there's some pretty detailed stuff going on in the background and I think you'll enjoy seeing how this was put together. So just before we jump into the After Effects project, let's discuss some of the production that went into this. This involved the small matter of the shoot. By saying small matter, I, of course, mean hugely important. The way things are shot and provided to you affect the way you approach post-production can either help or hinder you. Let me just freeze that for a second so we're not confused by this. These commercials 
needed to be delivered in full HD, by which I mean 1080p, which of course is 1920 by 1080 pixels in dimension. The camera used to shoot these commercials was an ARRI, a -R -R -I, D21 camera, which takes prime lenses. Essentially what we're dealing with here is effectively a film camera which delivers digital files. So the footage was actually provided to me uh, on an HD Cam SR digital tape. Now, that's the technical bit. Some of you will be more interested in that than others. Don't worry, there's not too much of that dry stuff in the rest of this tutorial, I promise. When I was in discussion with Aaron Rabinowitz about doing this tutorial, he observed that there appeared to be a lot of physical lighting taking place in this sequence alongside the post-production effects. He is, of course, absolutely right. Specific areas of the talent were lit to indicate areas where the effect would cast light. Now, I'd like to just show you what I mean by that. This is a raw version, if you like, of the commercial before any effects were applied. So different parts are being lit or left in shade quite deliberately. The director is choosing the areas in which he wants the effect to travel and has helped with the creation of the effect by using physical lighting as a starting point. The lighting was achieved by using a mini rig of dado lights, uh, that's D-E-D-O, in case you want to check them out on the internet, and these lights were individually triggered via dimmer switches. Although the idea was to have the talent primarily lit by the specific lights that is travelling around him, it was important to Julian, the director, that the experts didn't appear too ghostly, so some artistic judgement was involved, for example using some ambient light or some modelling light, and also choosing how far the dado lights were positioned from the expert. Not everything was done scientifically, but rather done with an artistic approach. The lights were given some random flickering, for example, to help sell the idea of these effects having life as they pass around the talent. Obviously, all of this is done in camera, before any effects have been applied, so the director needs to have a great idea of timing how the effect would flow through the piece right there on set. After the shoot, the rushes were supplied to us on digital tape, as I mentioned before, and then digitised into one of our Avid editing systems. The next step was for one of our editors here to create offline edits for each of the commercials whilst liaising with Julian and Ed, the producer, and finally each one was run through one of our Autodesk smoke suites to create an online edit of the base layer of each commercial. I then brought these clips into After Effects to start work on them. OK guys, I really hope you found all the background to this job interesting. This stuff really is fundamental to where you are at before you start working on something, before the effects actually, uh, you know, can start to be created. It's really just a kind of a taste of the kind of workflow that surrounds many of the jobs I do and I'm sure a lot of people do and without all of this background stuff there would really be far less interesting jobs to work on. However, I can guess you're all keen to move on to the main event so I would like to move on to the After Effects work itself. Here we are in a cleaned up project inside After Effects. I call it a cleaned up project because all I've basically done is taken everything that you uh, saw here in the uh, first part of the tutorial and I've just dropped it into a folder called previous just to clean things up just so that we're uh, not looking at clutter. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is bring in our edit which uh, is a series of DPX files and now there are 250 of those if we were to take that sequence drop it onto our create new comp icon we will end up with a 10 second piece which is 250 frames long obviously I'm working in the UK I'm working at 25 frames a second 250 10 seconds the maths is really easy for us over here the first thing I want to do with this now is break this up into shots um, I find that it's you know much easier to work on effect shots as individual items so I'm just going to hit shift command D at this point to split the layer we've now got shot one here which I will hit return type in shot uh, 001 okay and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-compose that and I'm going to hit shift command and C to uh, pre-compose now I always type PC for pre-composed it just helps me this little naming convention that I use go ahead and use it if, it, if it's useful for you and, and don't if, it, if, if it's not um, it doesn't really matter which of these we choose because we haven't done anything with this shot so there are no attributes to be left or moved um, it is what it is we'll hit OK on that OK so I'm just going to double click this layer now and go into it and of course we can see now I'm uh, sorry about this that a stage we just did was redundant actually uh, when you pre-compose a layer that you've trimmed down you actually still 
end up with the full length layer in your pre-composition. So I'm just going to find the end point that we wanted. It was here, wasn't it? Uh, I'm going to hit end on my keyboard and I'm going to hit control and click and I am going to trim the comp to the work area. So apologies for that slightly misleading step there. We But we now have our shot to length in a pre-composition, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to create uh, a little energy ball that uh, rises up from the bottom of frame, rises up along with Akram's hands, is compressed by his fingers and becomes a fine point, the point at which he uh, connects his fingers here, frame uh, 30. So what we're going to do is control and click and we are going to create ourselves a new solid. Now it doesn't really matter what colour you make this solid, it really doesn't. Um, I'm just going to make it black uh, for now, just keeps things easy. Hit OK to that. OK, so I'm going to rename this as um, Strokes, and we are going to get into using 3D Stroke. So in our Effects Controls panel here, I'm going to Control click again. I Control click a lot in After Effects, um, just to bring up contextual menus. I find it saves a lot of time. I'm going to scroll down, I'm going to find my trap code, 3D stroke option. Now, you'll notice that uh, as soon as 3D stroke is applied, the layer becomes transparent. Let's switch Acrum off. Let's switch that off so we're not being confused by that at the moment. Now, what I want to do is just draw a nice, fairly simple three-point stroke. Something like that. Something as simple as that, basically. I'm going to hold down... Uh, command, by the way, to alternate my tools here so that I can then pull points around, create the kind of curve that I want. Um, you know, that is, for today, that is absolutely fine. Now, 3D Stroke has various options in it, and the ones that we're interested in at the moment are thickness, which, you know, is pretty self explanatory. It just controls the thickness of the line, and feather, which controls uh, the softness of the edges of the line. Let's just zoom in here a bit, actually, so you can see a little bit clearer what it is I'm talking about. Okay, so with absolutely no softness, can you, you may not be able to see, hopefully you can. You see it sort of looks like it's getting a bit fatter, that's basically feathering going on. Let's increase the thickness actually so you can see. Here we go, yeah, you see that? So you've got the feathering going on there, um, or you haven't, you know, hard edge. So, you know, I want about 50%. I just want those edges to, to sort of bleed into the background a little bit, so I find that a little bit of feather really helps to sell that. Um, now, a thickness of 4 is what I want. Um, now what I'm going to do is, let's just get this on to uh, fit like this. Uh, the beauty of 3D Stroke is being able to not only offset a stroke like this, so it draws on from point, you know, the first vertex, which is here, that's the first point I drew, and that's the last vertex, the last point I drew. So it will always animate, you know, from first vertex to last. Uh, it you can animate that, which is which is great. But what you can also do with it is manipulate the strokes in a pseudo 3D environment. That's exactly what we're going to do in a moment. What we're first of all we're going to do is hit taper, uh, hit enable on taper. And what taper does is it literally does it, it, it tapers off the edges, the ends rather, I should say. If you just this this icon here, this this toggle mask and shape path visibility, really useful. Click it. Don't have to see the shape of the mask anymore. You can just see the effect really helps when you're looking at, you know, finer detail and all the rest of it. Let's zoom in there again. Um, so again, we can wipe that on. Now, you, I think, will already get a sense of, oh, okay, you know, something more interesting is happening now. With the taper effect, it suddenly becomes more fluid. Yeah, you know, before it was just a static line animating through. Now, it, it has a kind, of a, a kind of a life about it, which it didn't have before. And that's, that's just by switching that switch on. So, you know, uh, you can see that we're going to we're going to get somewhere pretty pretty quickly with with this, and that's what's that's what's fantastic about it. Now, I want to open up Transform. What we want to do is we want to actually bend this slightly. Now, there we go. Now, if we really push this, it'll it'll you can make some great great interesting shapes. We just want to we just want to bend it a little bit. We want to bend it, you know, just enough to create some interest here. Okay, so um, let's dial this up a little bit more, actually. Let's create a little bit more interest. Let's create something like, I don't know, let's type in 10. 
Okay, so we've got we've got a slightly freaked out line there. Uh, we want to duplicate this uh, layer uh, five more times so that we've got six lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. Basically, hitting Command D to duplicate these layers. Let's create a little bit more space here for us so we can see all of these. Let's isolate this first layer here by hitting our solo layer, our solo icon there. Nothing's happening with this at the moment. So what we want to do is we want to set a keyframe. Uh, we want to start our offset to be zero um, at, sorry, at zero frames, and we want to set it to be minus 100. We want to do about 14 frames of animation and push that offset all the way through. Now, what we will see as we move through is we have we have animation. Now that's precisely precisely what I wanted. Um, what we also want to do though is add a little bit because it's just you know you can see it's kind of a frozen line I think here. What we want to do then is animate the bend function, uh, the bend transformation. Let's click our stopwatch here. Let's hit U so you can see what's going on with these uh, keyframes. So we've got two keyframes here for offset from minus 100 to 100. We've set our bend to be 10 at the beginning and at the end we will set it to be I don't know. Let's say 15. See what we get. Let's do that. Let's do more. Let's do more. Let's let's be brave. Let's go up to sort of 25. Yeah. Ah, uh, now it's beginning to have a little bit of life about it, isn't it? I'm actually going to set that lower at the beginning to be something like 4.4. Uh, there, that's fine. There's no. There's no. By the way, there's no um, real kind of. Uh, uh, mathematical reason for any of these figures that I'm using. It's it's more just what what creates nice results. However, what I am uh, noticing is that we are getting yeah, you know, we're not getting we're not getting much life out of that, uh, are we? Considering our offset, yeah. Oh I, I okay. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. That that there you go. That's something to watch for. Minus one hundred, you cannot go any lower than it being completely at the start of your mask. But you can go beyond the end of the mask. Now, if someone can explain to me at a future time why that is, uh, maybe it's just a speed thing, perhaps, I don't know. Um, what we actually want to do, of course, is only have it max out at 100. Now we should get a much more fluid. There we go, that's what we want. All right. So let's preview that. Okay, there we go. Lovely. So we want to do that five times. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to go ahead and set that up five more times and I will see you in just a second. I've actually brought you in slightly earlier than I was going to because I've realised that I'm doing things here that actually I would quite like to show you and I think would be interesting for you. Um, I haven't just stuck with what I showed you with the first stroke. Um, what I've actually started to do uh, to create some interest, let's just solo um, our first layer hit have a look at where we were. Um, okay, so we've got this moving. We are animating um, the offset and we are animating the bend. Now, what I found to be interesting as well um, is to actually start animating the mask as well. So, if we, we we've obviously got our our um, you know toggle mask and shape path visibility back on, so we can see our mask and we can see it animating very very subtle um, little animation there. Um, again, on the third layer, you know, it's a different shaped mask, obviously. Um, and again, there's just a very subtle animation on it. It's just little things to add life and movement to these. Um, so, you know, I was tweaking these masks and I realised really, you know, I should be making you aware of what's going on. Um, that's the whole point of this, of course. But at the same time, we've saved a good while there of me going through all of these layers and setting you know, keyframes and all, you know, creating slightly different masks and all the rest of it. So, you know, we're beginning to get something that's sort of quite interesting, the way these all, um, you know, interact together. It's it's creating quite a nice feel. Um, this is the last one that I need to do, so I thought I may as well, you know, dip back into it here and show you what I'm doing. This, of course, is at the moment a duplication of our original stroke layer. I've not yet tweaked it. So what I've noticed, actually, is that the bend, if you bend these things too much, they, they actually end up right in the centre of screen. Uh, let me just solo this uh, so you can see what I mean. Um, and this is something to bear in mind when you're, you're bending your, your, your 3D strokes. If you if you crank bend right up, you will end up with what looks a little bit like a tadpole or something. Um, and actually it becomes very, very, very far away indeed from your original um, 
sketch there now let me sketch i say sketch you know it's actually obviously it's a mask here but you, you, you know what i mean the line that you've created um so if we take that bend back down um like so it actually begins to return back to its original form and i actually do want something closer to uh this line here so if we unsolo that we've got everything back ah now hello we are beginning to get something quite interesting what's happening here of course is i've I've actually accidentally keyframed my band. Let's just move that so it replaces our first one. Let's reduce this back down to say something like three. So actually we're using the fact that the bend function kind of squishes lines in towards the center of screen as a benefit here uh, because we want these lines to be kind of contained within a sphere and so by cranking up the bend a little bit we're actually pushing these lines into a more central position kind of keeping them contained in this sphere-like shape, which is precisely what we want. What I want to do with these actually now is I want to offset them all. Um, so I want them all to uh, basically, let's say, come in every every sort of, I don't know, four frames or something. So what we can do is just literally hit our you know, page down icon, uh, <laughs> sorry, page down button, one, two, three, four, hit our layer that we want and hit our sort of you know our square open bracket key to push that in line one two three four and again one two three four and again one two three four and again one two three four and for one final time there we go now there we go we have actually got every line now overlapping and it's still contained within our original opening shot duration Apologies if you've just seen the screen jump there slightly. What I've actually done is started the rest of this tutorial on uh, the following day. Um, so I'm trying to continue exactly from exactly where I'd left off. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to take our pre-comp shot 001 PC. We want to drop that onto our create new comp icon in order to pre-compose it inside another composition. Let me just move those lines in the center of the uh, screen there for you. And what we want to do is we want to add a bit of pseudo 3D-ness to these lines. Uh, effectively what I want to do is um, indicate that they're inside a transparent sphere, if you like. Now the simple easy way of doing that is within our effect controls panel, control click, go to distort, find our bulge function, and it brings up this little circle here. And what we want to do is increase the horizontal radius and vertical radius in order to increase the size of the circle, which is in fact the area in which the effect will be applied. We want to increase that to go across all of the lines that we see in our composition. Move our center here. And you can see they're bulging out already, so hopefully you can see, let's zoom in a little bit for you. You see how they're, they're basically being bulged by the effect. That's exactly what we want to do. Um, what we want to do is mess around with bulge height a little bit. There we go. So now, do you see they've got, let's just zoom in again for you. Do you see that they've got just a little bit more of an indication of sweeping around a sphere, perhaps? Uh, I, I just think it's subtle but that's, you know, we're in the business of subtlety, I think. I like that. I think that adds a little something to those lines. You can see you know, the way this is now curving around. It's just, I think that just really helps. But I don't want to stick with just one layer. I want to duplicate that layer, and I want to have a front and a back. So why not rename these front, rename this one back. And the, one of the reasons why I've used the bulge function, not the spherize function, is bulge can either come towards us or, or push away from us, um, the bulge height can go into minus figures. So let's solo our back layer and let's push our bulge height back to say, you know, around about 1, 1.1. 1 .1. And let's just have a quick look at that. So it's basically given us, you know, they've got smaller, they've been pushed, you know, effectively, they haven't been pushed further back in space in any true real 3D way, but, uh, you know, they appear to have been pushed back in space. If we add them together you can see the difference yeah there's, there's kind of got an element of, of an element of, of distance now between those but i don't want them to be exact duplicates i don't want you to see effectively it almost looks like an echo um but 
In order to make this a little bit different, it's very simple. I'm just going to open up the scale and put in a minus in front of our 100 there, and there we go. I like that. I think that that's that's got interest to it now. So to add more interest, I'm sure you're you're keen to to move on with uh, getting this composited as soon as possible. And so am I. I appreciate this tutorial beginning to get in onto the fairly lengthy side so I may speed up just very slightly here apologies if I start going a little fast um, what I'm going to do is add some color to this and the easiest way to do that is to take our shot 001 PC2 and drop it onto a new comp icon again okay so we've got our composition like this now what I want to do is uh, you know we've, we've got this composition that's actually a full HD composition um, you know these lines exist within a full 19, 20, 1080 frame, they really don't need to. So very quickly I'm going to hit Command R to bring up the rulers and I'm going to find our the points at which the lines reach their most extreme position on the left, the right, the bottom and the top. And I'm going to drop a ruler in there just as a guide like so. So it's around about there. We don't have to be absolutely you know, pin, yeah, pixel perfect here. Um, it's just really just to make sure that when when I crop this, which is what I'm about to do, I don't crop any of the action out. It's, you know, just for reference. Okay, I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty happy with that. So we've we've got approximately, you know, it's it's approximately a sort of a square shape, isn't it here? In order to crop a composition, really very simple again, uh we're going to go down to our region of interest icon here, click region of interest, draw out over our um over our rulers that we've just drawn out for ourselves for our reference and we're going to go up to composition and we are going to crop our comp to region of interest okay and that is done there we go oh now actually you see that's an error so let's go back now I, I obviously I obviously didn't go far enough did I there we go so very quickly I will just do that again apologies for that Okay, I'm happy with that. That's all contained now. That's great. Well, what we want to achieve here is these neon colors, these really uh, bright, saturated colors. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to work in 32-bit. Now, there isn't enough time in this tutorial to really go into the scope of you know what 32-bit is, etc. But very simply, it allows us to create what are called overbrights, which are oversaturated colors. We're allowed to go effectively you know, beyond white. Um, we can add more red or more blue or more green. Once we've reached what would effectively normally be peak white, we can actually add beyond that. And what happens, happens there is when you start blowing objects or lines or layers that have got overbrights in them, that allows that extra saturation to bleed through. I'm going to demonstrate what I mean very shortly. So if you're not quite with me at the moment, don't worry, it's all going to become very clear, hopefully. So we're obviously at the moment we're working in eight bits per channel. We want to option click, hold on option or alt, you know, 8, 16, 32. Cycle through to 30, 32 bit. We want to create a new solid like so and we want to choose create a new color. Now our RGB doesn't behave in the way you'd expect in 8-bit. Uh, in 8-bit you'd expect to see it dial up to you know 255 uh, maximum up for red, green and blue. Here you get these crazy numbers like 9.24 and all the rest of it. Effectively to achieve peak white all we need to do is type in 1, 1 and 1. Okay so you can see straight away we're working on very different um, very different levels to 8-bit uh, but as I said we want to create an overbright. This is a, effectively our peak white we want to add more red than anything else and so what we're going to do is we're going to put 2.5 okay so it still looks like white okay because it, it, we can't show you beyond peak white but what happens is when we uh, drop our let's rename this solid as an overbrights solid when we track mat that there we go now you should see straight away we've got something really interesting happening. We've got peak white in the center and we've got this kind of red being revealed. Now this is all to do with the, you know, the, the, the softness, um, the feather that we added um, to our lines, the way that's kind of petering out is allowing red to come through, um, the way it's being matted out is allowing some of the red to come through on uh, from the overbrights layer, but uh, 
it gets really really exciting in just a moment if we take our shot 001 PC3 which really I should name these shouldn't I let's call this uh, excuse me let's click in here let's call this our over bright lines okay lovely there we go and let's create another new composition with our over bright lines in it there they are looking already rather nice what I want to do is I want to add a glow to these to really demonstrate to you the kind of exciting colors you can get out of using 32-bit so I'm going to go down to um, stylize I'm going to find glow wow okay yeah you know that is just a glow of one right a radius of 10 now I'm sure you guys have all applied a glow before and <laughs> you know you do not get those results out of a glow do you um, with that kind of low setting if we increase in, uh, if we increase the radius I mean look at that that is just electric isn't it you only get that with 32 bit color okay so I'm just doing this uh, in this composition just as a demonstration really for you um, let's actually switch that glow off for now what we want to do is get into compositing this now we want to get into the you know, let's start concluding this part of this tutorial uh, open up shot your first uh, pre-composition composition rather I should call it really uh, that we created this shot 001 uh, obviously we've got our this is where we started building our strokes um, we had our acrim layer in the background well this acrim layer is what we now want in a new composition so you may as well just duplicate that up again and let's rename this uh, excuse me let's rename this composite 001 okay uh, what we actually want to do is just take this layer through to our composite 001 just cop oh, what I did was copy and paste it from here this this layer is now redundant get rid of it okay what we want to do now let's bin this layer uh, window here by the way let's get rid of that okay so now we want to composite our exciting lines into our acrim shot so let's go ahead and do that so we've got our over bright lines we want to drop them into our acrim shot there we go oh look at that right that's gonna look great isn't it let's scale them down slightly okay and let's start compositing so what we want to do is basically animate these from out of shot we want to follow his hands uh, up here until he pinches it together and it will become nothing it just becomes like a tiny infinitesimal <laughs> ball of energy um, so very simply let's move our layer off let's create a pivot position create a keyframe and I'm not going to track anything here, uh, not for the purposes of what we're doing today. I'm just going to animate this by hand. It's, it, you know, I mean, actually, look how much we're going to get away with this anyway. It, it, it's not exactly the hardest piece of animation I've ever had to do. But what I'd want to do, of course, is scale this as well simultaneously. So at this point, we really want our scale to be um, pretty much at zero. Uh, let's just yeah let's make it zero so it's just pinched between his fingers okay and here we want this to be a hundred well not a hundred percent let's scale that up it doesn't need to be that big does it we were around about sort of forty percent or so weren't we I believe and I think we want to keep that actually we don't we want to keep it just so that it's just there we go just being kept within his hands and then it gets pinched down to nothing Let's just move that up there as well. Okay. So it moves up with his hands. Maybe it just needs to be slightly higher at this point. Maybe about there. Maybe again here. It just needs to move up slightly. I kind of want it to be... I want there to be a relationship between our lines and, and his fingers here. Alright. Okay. I think that's going to do us, isn't it, for animation terms. Obviously we could sit and tweak it, but yeah, I'm conscious again of the duration of this tutorial. So... I think that's looking really nice. Now, of course, you'll notice it's going over his finger here. You know, come the real thing, we would mask that finger back over top of it uh, in order to, you know, to composite it back in, in order to make it believable that that's actually, you know, behind his hand here. Uh, what we want to do is apply our lovely glow. 
So uh, it's already sat there at the top because we, we just looked at it, didn't we? Let's increase our radius slightly. Let's take the intensity right down. Yeah, you know, this is where you start getting some really nice, subtle... Let's zoom in there for you. Let's make sure we're on full resolution for you here as well. OK, we're at 200%, which is why it's slightly steppy. Um, you can see it just creates a really lovely glow there. But I actually wanted to create three versions of this layer. Uh, in order to get a stronger glow going on, uh, we're into the realms of taste now. Um, how far you want to push this as a, as a designer, what the look is you're trying to achieve, what your client wants. Um, now, in this instance, what I actually did, and this is something that is quite interesting, uh, when you're working in 32-bit colour, you can restrict which layers are working in 32-bit. And the way in which you can do that is by applying an effect which actually doesn't work in 32-bit. So, for example, if we were to apply a fill, which is only an 8-bit effect, you have got here an exclamation mark which indicates that that effect is not working in the bits per channel mode that you've got here, which is obviously our 32 bits. So what you can actually do with this, uh, if we were to say, for example, put a little, little bit of a pinkish fill into that layer, is you can start affecting the strength of the glows, the way in which these layers are working together. And so you can create a slightly more subtle effect sometimes, whilst also maintaining uh, some of this really nice 32-bit glow. It's kind of being able to combine these layers is really useful uh, to create the exact effect that you want. Uh, I'm not going to get into layering this up anymore uh, or affecting this much more because I think we've kind of really covered all that. And I think it'd be interesting now to have a look at how one of the other shots uh, was put together. Um, you can effectively see where we're at with this shot and how I got to the final thing, I think, from what we've what we've covered so far. So, you know, that's looking that's looking good. So if we jump across to another composition, um, if I was to open up our previous folder here, let's jump into our master composition here. Now let's find shot two. Let's just drag this over so you can see what's going on. So let's jump across to shot two here. Let's open this up. Okay, so really to round things up here, I just wanted to go through a little bit of how this shot was made. I have a top layer here in which I have rotoscoped out his fingers, his arm, his hand, and I've been pretty logical about it. I've named all of our layers here appropriately, uh, or sorry, I should say all of our masks here. Um, and, you know, just a very quick thing about rotoscoping. If you are doing something that moves a lot over time, which, you know, there are great differences on a frame-to-frame -frame basis, which there are in something like this, where, you know, obviously this hand is moving dramatically. Um, it sometimes, well, it's almost more often than not, it pays to rotoscope out specific areas like, for example, I have here, the main part of his hand, his little finger, his ring finger, middle finger. And that way you can concentrate on a specific area. It's easier to, to, to deal with that rather than having one mask that tries to describe everything. You guys might already be aware of that, but it's, it's just a useful tip, if you're not, to approach rotoscoping in a way that just makes life more easy for you. Um, so again, it's a layered up version of these strokes, um, and all I did, just to round this section up, all I did here was I just had an open mask, endpoint here, endpoint here, uh, which I animated over time. Let me just preview this for you. Okay, so that's, uh, that's previewed that now. Let me just open this up a little bit so you can see exactly what's going on. OK, that's better. So what we actually have here is one animated stroke, which is an open path, on which I then choose to animate the offset of the 3D stroke at the appropriate time. And then I actually just have two static masks, which is this one drawing around here, and this one looping around here that follows the motion of his hand. Now, of course, they don't look static because the 3D stroke's animating across them, but it's just to show you just how simple that setup is. Um, and with the 
rotoscoping again with the 32-bit color you actually and the animation of course of the stroke itself and of this one mask it really feels you know like a very dynamic little bit of animation when actually not that much is going on under the hood really um, so yeah, if you wanted to have a quick look at this we could just get in here and there you go it's as simple as that we just have this stroke here which I animate up and then the offset here only actually kicks in here frame 13 and just and just animates it out as that mask kind of turns into a loop and then these two as you can see are static the masks themselves don't actually move at all so that's what's going on there and I mean when you look at this this is why I wanted to show you this when you look at this mat run effectively of these strokes you can see how simple that is in terms of how it's been put together obviously it looks far more dramatic far more exciting than the original map run would, would have you believe. So I think in conclusion guys I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, I think we've covered everything that then led to me being able to create all the rest of this commercial um, if we just preview this again so we can see. So we've built shot one, we had a look at shot two, but you can now see our shot three, four, five etc how these would have all been built in exactly the same way I mean, the end, the end section there is actually using track code form to create that, uh, that wipe across there, which I think we're running out of time on this tutorial now, so I won't go into that. Maybe we can look at form some other time. So, in conclusion, uh, the effects that we've used here are appropriate to the concept. They tell a story. We start with that little ball of energy squeezed into a single point, and over the course of a 10 second commercial, it comes alive as those streams of light which represent the kinetic energy released by the, the dancer's movements. I chose to use 3D Stroke uh, because it's such a quick effect to use. It's really easy to modify it. It's the obvious choice to create these kind of fluid animations. Well, I hope this has been interesting for you guys. I hope it's given you an insight into some ways of working, along with some of the decision making early on in the process and some of the hard work that comes from all directions before it even comes anywhere near the post-production side of things. So I've really enjoyed making this tutorial uh, and I hope to do more soon. I hope you enjoyed watching it. Once again, my name is Owen Street and I'm very proud to be making this tutorial on behalf of Red Giant. Thank you very much. Take care. See you soon. Thanks, Owen. Great stuff. We hope to have you back again soon to share more of your techniques. As I mentioned earlier, Owen is a motion graphics artist, compositor, and designer, and he works at a company called 422 based in Manchester, England. You can find them at 422.tv. Also, you can see more of Owen's work at both www.behance.net forward slash Owen Street and at www.vimeo.com forward slash Owen Street. Don't forget, you can download a free trial version of Trapcode 3D Stroke and the entire Trapcode suite at RedGiantSoftware.com. And you can get tons of free presets for Red Giant plugins at RedGiantPeople.com. Finally, I want to mention that if you're looking to keep up with what we're doing at Red Giant, whether it's a tutorial, a contest, a product release, or whatever, just follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our blog. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for Red Giant TV. I'll see you next time.